Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I am here with two of my dear colleagues today, Johanna Nichols and Martha McAlpine. Both are teachers, leaders, gosh, really lights in their work. Both are homeschooling their children. This has come up many, many times in the recent weeks and months, obviously, since quarantine began. And I want to welcome you both here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Absolutely having us. Absolutely a pleasure. So apparently 10% of the United States is homeschooling their children at this time, which means that these are kids who are not enrolled in school. They're not in virtual school. They're not in school on Zoom. They are not enrolled in a school. This is interesting to me and also daunting to me. I've never been brave enough to do this work with my own kid. I want to talk to you guys today about what works, what doesn't, and enlighten and enrich my listener who might be a parent and might be interested in this possibility for their own child, might be somehow disoriented or even dysregulated by their child sitting in front of a screen all day. I know that I have these very same reservations myself. So Martha, I'd like to start with you and talk to you a little bit about what precipitated your decision to homeschool and how it's going. Oh, thank you, Elena. It was not by choice. <laughs> As I think about the experience that so many families are having right now, it's familiar. We were in a great private school. Maddox was halfway through the third grade and it was getting more and more difficult. He didn't want to get up. He didn't want to get ready. He didn't want to go. And when he would come home, he was belligerent and difficult. And more importantly, it felt like he was allergic to school. His skin became absolutely scaly with eczema. His legs so uncomfortable that he would scratch them until he bled. His eyelids had eczema. And at the time, I was studying with the Handel Group in the program that you had created with Hildy about the combination of yoga and coaching. And I'm immersed in this and I'm learning so much. And I'm looking at nothing that I am learning now about myself was being established in his school setting, who he is as a person, who he could be. And it was halfway through the year. It was halfway through the week. And he came home and I looked at him and I said, you're we're, we're not doing this anymore. We just can't do this. We need to do something else. Mm. And very fortunately, I was, uh, my master's degree is in experiential education design. So I design experiences, not necessarily the content, but the way that we experience the content so that it can become our own. And just like anyone else, doing that for my own child was, was daunting. And yet, this was a necessity. Mm. We couldn't go on this way anymore. Right. Martha, you are a comparative literature student from Princeton University. You have a master's in experiential curriculum design from Harvard's grad school of education. So you're a serious serious gal. You've been a workshop facilitator, a multimedia producer, an information architect for Fortune 500 companies during the dot-com boom. And now you practice and teach yoga publicly and privately for over 25 years. You even lead the philosophy portion of the Yoga Works Advanced Teacher Training in Baltimore. So 
we're hearing someone who is a serious educator by nature. So in case you're feeling, uh, if you're listening and you're feeling like, oh my God, that's not me. You know, maybe it's not you, but here's somebody who really has taken it on and who is doing it with a level of care that, you know, most of us don't find natural. So I'm interested in hearing a little bit more, but let's, let's meet Johanna first. Johanna, tell us a little bit about why you chose or choose to homeschool your kids and what, what precipitated that? Oh, thank you, Elena. You know, I just want to start off by saying there are so many ways to seek the development of these whole people, right? Um, and for me, the first time I felt the need to draw them back in to me was when I was about to have my third baby and my children were out at various support systems, even though they were still young. Um, my oldest at the time was about four and a half, and I had a two-year-old. And I wanted everyone to be in this womb-like setting. I knew that when we had a baby, another baby, I wanted everyone to be close. I wanted them to be part of my nourishment, um, that rest and recovery. And um, that was such a special time. And it wasn't really until the birth of our fourth baby that I really got to do 40 days in. And that changed our whole family. That experience, that pulling in and bringing everyone back um, mm. really changed the way we felt. I felt stronger as a mother than I'd ever felt. And, you know, at the before the birth of this baby, I was feeling very depleted. I was feeling exhausted. I wasn't sure how to keep going. So when I pulled everyone in, there was really this time to nurture our physical and mental health that there hadn't been before. And then when there was a release after that, where my oldest and my, um, my sons went back to school, and I was there with the baby, I didn't feel that need to pull anyone back in until um, my son began having experience with PANS syndrome, which is um, a pediatric neurological disorder. It just came about where one day he woke up different. And um, it's kind of hard to explain unless you have one who has PANDAS or PANS themselves. I was not familiar with it at the time. And it's, for him, it showed up as a rapid onset of OCD. Everything, even coming down the steps, took about 40 minutes, things that we normally would not have been thinking about. And we were so fortunate. We had this wonderful supportive Waldorf school that we were attending, and the teachers and the parents and our friends were so supportive in helping me bring the other ones home and helping me work here. But it, it really felt like we were falling apart and at that moment, I knew that he needed to be pulled back into this space, almost like a womb, too. And, and that was when mid-year we decided, okay, things need to shift. Let's pull him back in. And at the time, he and my youngest were the only ones home. I had two extroverts still at school. And he remained home last year, and we saw great progress. He is no one would ever know <laughs> that he still suffers with some OCD. And that pulling in helped rebuild our energy and replenish it because it, re it really is a relationship of mm. the family. It's not just a single child. You're an artist. You're now obviously inspired by Waldorf to homeschool your kids. You're trained as a chef. And your life's work, Johanna, is so much about ceremony and ritual and earth and health and home. I work with you closely and I'm honored to do so. And your, your focus is on the empowerment of women. Um, what I would love to talk to you about, particularly the lunar cycle, but I'd love to talk to you about is, before we get back to Martha, how does having four children at home every day work for you to continue the work that you do and you do significant work. I mean, you and I are very close in our business and um, I'm always just this side of amazed that you have time. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how you schedule yourself, how you work with the children and even your husband to accomplish this very serious mission of homeschooling. 
Yes, thank you, Elena. I think it really comes to rhythm for us. Holding a weekly rhythm has been so important and a daily rhythm. And we move often, um, but we have felt that we can really hold the container of space for our children um, for each other by having a strong rhythm. And that doesn't mean a structure. So we're not eight, 10, we've got to be, you know, eating. It's really more of a lightness of, okay, today is a Monday and it's going to feel a little bit more lunar. It's going to feel more spacious. So we're going to create more today. And Tuesdays perhaps have more of a driven energy and we can kind of get more down to business, you know, and kind of knowing what works for us, but not being attached. <laughs> I, I find so many of the things with homeschooling is a lot of non-attachment. I'm sure Martha right. will agree. Um, Very much the yoga. Yes. <laughs> no attachment to outcome. But this is generally how... I like so far the idea of certain days or certain things. Let's let's continue before I put the question to Martha. I think um, for us to, I have found that our children are perfectly themselves <laughs> in every moment. So really just finding the space within myself to be ready, embraced for whatever they bring me, right? So I was so fortunate to have my beginnings of a mother in this Waldorf Foundation, which I really feel has supported me so much. Um, and there's a book called You Are Your Child's First Teacher. And she has said, the things that you need are sleep, which some of us <laughs> are getting a lot of, are art and meditation. So making room for myself first, right? Whether that means waking up early or going out and touching the earth with my bare feet, um, mm. but really allowing myself to be supported, then I can meet them where they are. Right. Martha, I'd love to hear how you kind of look at the structure and the cadence of a week and how it works for your household. I think that it's quite similar that... It's easy to think that homeschoolers are simply implementing a curriculum at home. Right, 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 right. Of course. That is, comp it's absolutely an option. But it sort of takes, it sort of and takes you can away get... the whole, pardon me for interrupting, but it takes away the whole idea of letting everybody be themselves and letting everybody do their thing, you know, within, within reason. It's important to understand the scale though. Right. Because I think once you understand the, the scale of schooling available, you can place yourself without judgment or comparison because you find the place where you're comfortable. By scale of schooling available, to explain to us what that means. Sure, sure. So you, ha you could simply have school in a box, right? Here's my workbook. Here's my timing. This is how it goes. Very similar to school, but at your kitchen table. Right. And... And we can assume that that's what homeschooling looks like. Let's call that like the far right side of the scale. And the far left side of the scale would be the movement of unschooling, where there isn't a structure, there isn't even a curriculum. It's allowed to be driven by what are the children interested in today? Um, what's happening in the world today? It's very interest driven. And it trusts, it's an incredible amount of trust that this human being is whole, Mm. she, he, they will attune to what's important mm. over time. Mm. And I'm just trusting this and I'm going along with it. That can be really unsettling. Yeah. So yeah, if it's very Montessori. Style. I remember walking my kid into Montessori when he was almost two and going, yes, well, we have most of the day they're allowed to just go and pick their work. And I'm like, what? You know, and all, yeah. all of a sudden, it was like somebody took an anvil, like a giant something heavy to my <laughs> head, cracked it open and was like, oh, actually, right. This is a person who knows what they want and 
that's perfectly legitimate to let that person go and explore what's interesting to them and emphasize that. My mind was blown. So I get what you're saying. Okay. So, but the thing is, here's what happens. Our fear around that is that my kid is going to choose to sit on the couch and read Garfield. If I give him the opportunity, he's going to check out. And the, the difficulty with that is that, A, it's very likely. And part of the reason that it's likely is that most of us have been schooled within a, within a formal education institution. When we began to homeschool, we had a two and a half year period of detox. It was so regimented against such small minds that what he knew was what he was incapable of. That's what he had learned. So these this two and a half years, sort of deconstructing what was a very rigorous structure, i.e. school life, like proper mm -hmm. school life. What, yeah. what was happening day by day in those times? He had to be given permission to choose. And what's fascinating is you don't really have a whole lot of choice about school until your sophomore year at college, and then you're asked to declare a major. Right. It's so fun. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Of course. It's crazy. Choosing is such a skill. And I think that that's very much at the heart of handout work, that when we begin to develop an ability to say, how, what outcome am I seeking and what choices support that outcome, that's so important to who we become as human beings, but it's a skill. And then after that, it's a muscle that you have to continue to refine. And I think your teachings in particular, one of the reasons that I listen to you as a teacher is that you are helping establish adults go through that same process of you are the architect of your time. What do you want to accomplish? What are the actions that support that? They aren't taught this. And so we had to back out and allow him to make some really poor choices <laughs> and experience for himself. How do you feel after four hours of Fruit Ninja? How's that go for you? Dude, right? I got really okay. good at Fruit Ninja at a certain point. <laughs> I got really good at Garfield. Oh, my God. Um, because I had to go with him. So we, what that looked like for us over, so over time, we just, first we needed to sleep, then we needed to be outside, then we needed to really improve our food because all of those get disrupted in the school schedule. And then we began to find what are the things that create an extended focus for him? When am I truly focused in my own choice? And he would have a bin of Legos and an audio book and he wouldn't look up for four hours. And the school was saying he has an attention problem. And I said, I don't, I really don't think so. But if you find the right thing, Stephen Mitchell writes that prayer is when we lose track of time. And I needed to find what are the things that my children do and they lose track of time. That's when they are themselves. So if that meant sitting down and, and reading Garfield because no one was telling him not to, it meant that Garfield wasn't off limits. And now he's reading books that are way beyond me. He follows different authors from MIT and Stanford. He's absolutely engaged because he chose it. Right. And now he's moving at pace. Right, right, right. I get this. So the, the end note to that yeah. that's really important for anybody that's listening is you're going to hit potentially, potentially, a place where your kid, A, doesn't know what to do with free time, They've got a little bit more of it, and there's going to be a point where it looks like they're not doing anything productive, and that can feel scary. But just like when they were babies, though, I mean, you know, the minute you feel like you're having like a, such a slide backwards, babies, toddlers, all of a sudden there's a giant leap forwards. It's almost the same thing with any age, really. Over and over. And we do it as adults. And this is how an adult lives a life. We, we choose a goal. I really want to know how to, I don't know, play polo. All right, so, so let me get some things in place to figure out how to play polo. It's an expensive and if sports you learn, system. 
<laughs> Seriously. <laughs> if you learn how to put those pieces in place, big picture learning says all you need to learn is what to do when you don't know how to do it. Right. And how to sort of reach for the first thing. It's sort of like the, that really sweet definition of Dharma. What's the next thing to do? Yeah. <laughs> That's your Dharma yeah. right now. I love that. In, in school, you're not given the moment of waiting until that strikes because it's already defined for you. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to study next. How can your Dharma surface in that setting? But on the other side, it's wonderful that we're exposed to different teachers, to different topics, to different subjects. So that's really very necessary for us to know what's possible. Right. I'm starting to get a greater idea of the trajectory of this choice, which is, I think, I think this might have been the most important aspect, which was you know, so many parents are considering this right now, not just due to the quarantine, but due to so many other factors, really. I'm speaking to my listener who's both on one side of the political equation and the other. I'm not, uh, there's no, I'm not, I don't want to bring in politics here, but, you know, some people are afraid to keep their kid in school because there's not enough information that's true to history. Some people are afraid to keep their kid in school because there's too much. Like, it's very polarizing right now. So, okay. Homeschooling. Elena. Yes, ma'am. Can I add? Yes. That you, the way that you speak about the oils as a reclamation of our health, hmm. I think about homeschooling as a reclamation wow. of our learning. Say more about that. You may feel that in the school setting, the information they're receiving doesn't feel right to you. And so you have an opportunity at home to look up anything you choose. At the same time, for me, one of the definitions of homeschooling is that then the child is encouraged and enabled to look up for themselves further information about that topic. And they may self-evolve far beyond what you plan to show them. Right. We are reclaiming the ownership is yours. Okay. And we must give it to the children. Just like when you're telling me, how do you feel? And now how do you want to feel? Mm. And these are the oils and the pathways that you could choose. Mm. Similarly, what do I want to know? What do I want to be capable of? And now let me work with you so that you make yourself capable of that. Mm. I would... That makes perfect sense. Jo Johanna, let me ask yeah. you a question. When you started homeschooling, had you ever put your kids in a regular school? You had put your kids in a regular school. When you started, what was that, what was that well, transition like? Our children were in a Waldorf school. So Waldorf is probably the farthest school from a public school that you could go. So I feel very spoiled in the sense that my children were absolutely seen and heard and um, allowed to really think for themselves in that program. I, th I think I can't say enough good things about their experience within that school system. I also, it, when Martha was talking, I was thinking, oh, we're three yogis <laughs> speaking about our experience with schooling and our children's experience with schooling. So we will always likewise probably meet in this place where we're, we find challenges as spiritual inspiration. And um, I love that Martha went on to say, you know, she was talking about interoception, like the body's ability to sense itself from the inside and allowing our children to have that experience is pretty amazing because a lot of adults don't even really have that experience on a regular basis. Um, we're maybe having more of a proprioception, the body's ability to kind of sense itself in space. And I think when we improve right. that interoception, when we're turning inward, we improve our sense of self, we improve our sense of self, and we really can get clearer about the meaning and purpose of our life. And 
if we know how we want to feel, you can figure out who you are. And if you know who you are, you know what to do. Um, Martha and I have different age children. So all of my children are under 12. So my children do not have the same freedom to explore online. Um, in our, we try very hard to keep screens to a minimum. Mm though that has not been (laughs) always the case in quarantine, right? Um, And I perhaps have come to this from a different experience than Martha. I really did not like school growing up, neither did my husband. Um, We were smart kids and we chose, we decided even actually our marriage vows were based off of how we wanted to raise our children. And, um, I didn't like working for others, so I chose not to. I um, I don't like to spend a lot of time indoors, so I don't, right? So a lot of my decisions are based off of me realizing that maybe I'm not a great fit for the mainstream events. So it's a little bit of a rebellion, and I see that in my children too. And at least in our life, I feel that my task in this current age, the current situation is just to subtract, just to be removing, to be clarifying, to simplify, um, to really allow serenity to flourish, we need to remove. So a lot of it is setting up time for my kids to say, I'm bored. That is a joy, you know, and it's hard to get to that point that's now in these days, right? There's so many things to do online and TV and this, and removing a lot of things has allowed them that exploration that Martha was talking about um, to really choose what to focus on. And you can begin to see them clearly. And it really is, you know, a commitment to each other. I'm committed to them in this life. And, and, Right. Part of that is stepping away. My sort of urgent next question, how do you survive as a family to working parents at home with four kids? What is it what does it look like day by day? You know, I know that we have a certain day of the week for each sort of vibe, but like how do you handle it with your man? You know, I I feel so lucky. Uh Dave is a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> which which I am not. And he really anchors our morning for us. You know, he he runs breakfast. He's the king of the castle. He can just get in there and, you know, he's short order cooking and kind of sets the tone. Whereas I can linger in this dream state, kind of sleepier getting there and and kind of having those set roles. We don't do well when we have two cooks in the kitchen, right? <laughs> so knowing, you know, our children yeah. probably suffer enough with two type A um, neurotic parents. So trying to allow one person to kind of steer the boat. And we really love being outside. I think that's part of it. Um, choosing our values as a family has been really important and actually saying them out loud. Um, even our youngest knows the importance we have on connecting with the earth, right? And we are mm-hmm. the keepers of the earth. And we also, one of our values as a family is speaking up for those who don't have a voice. And, you know, really s- things that sound very simple, but can be very big depending on how far we can go into them. So really knowing our values, knowing what we value has been really important. My littlest daughter, she when she was three, told her friend that Dave and I were entre- entrepreneurs, she said. And I thought, oh. <laughs> and I thought, that's wow, hilarious. I am so I am doing something right, right? Like that's the feeling I had. Like, oh, she knows. Yes. And then her friend asked, what is that? And she said, Oh, I think um, she makes like salad dressing. (laughs) Oh, oh my God. And I thought, oh, dear. Okay, this is genius. (laughs) And I said, well, Papa's an entrepreneur too. And she said, oh, then they're, I'm sorry, they're designers. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my and god, that's so good. I, I love them. And so I think homeschooling so is really about forging a family identity as a team. And it's about learning to work together, right? And and my kids know like, hey, mm. this day I need help with this. This is what it's going to look like. And this is what helped how I view help, <laughs> right? We need to explain sometimes what we need clearly. Um, so we're coming into matters of communication. Yes. We're coming into defining who is in charge of what moment in time and also encouraging a sense of not just definition, but also pride in what your family mm -hmm. stands for. Yes. Which I think is sort of these three arms or guiding principles, if you will. This is good. This is really good. If somebody's listening, I'm trying to I'm trying to tease out from everything that you two are saying what my listener could take and then maybe implement. You know, maybe maybe they feel the same way that both of you do, which is, you know, my kid's kind of allergic to school and it's just not for for them. Mm -hmm. So this is great. Um, I, oh, if I don't, Martha, do you have a sense of? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going go to say too. I I really want to offer up that. Um, on any given day, I, sometimes we feel really um, just shackled and some days feel really free and spacious. So even for those of us with good support systems, so I have a lot of friends who homeschool, I have mentors who help me, any moment, there can be great suffering. And I think that that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing it wrong. I want to just put that out there too, that there is... The joy arrives when we ha when we are able to learn to live in this moment. So even in this quarantine and all of these hardships, um, there's a lot of them coming up, right? And the practice is just staying steady. And we've been given so much practice lately. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. Martha, do you have a similar many sort of practice or the way in which you prioritize what's important and salient for your family at any given moment? I learned too late how important I am. Right. I wish I had known that sooner. Hmm. I set the tone. I am the glue. And that's not necessarily the case for every household, but for me, I did. I had the selfless mother idea going that I would just be always available. Our and listening to what Johanna said, the stay, the idea, that practice of just being able to stay with what's happening. I remember my son was probably two and a half, and I thought hell is a place of endless matchbox cars. Dude, and play with them. <laughs> all we, we had lines of them, like in rainbow arrays all over the floor. It's like, oh my God, that's yes. everything right there. Yeah. And so I would put on a timer and think, okay, I'm going to play matchbox cars for three minutes. I'm going to make it. I can make it for three minutes playing matchbox cars. I didn't realize how much discomfort was in that. And the reason, and then I felt very stingy with my time. I felt very resentful. And I felt like a failure because of those that combination. Who am I as a mother if I can't sit and play with this amazing little kid? And the mm. only way to become generous, it's going to make me cry, was to be more generous with myself. So in this time, start with you. Find some time in the morning and let it be known that it's okay. Tell your people, little ones and big ones, I need 20 minutes. And you can do anything you want in those 20 minutes, but what you're doing is you're meeting that need so that you can become a little more generous. And I know and mine have come to respect, I need that time. And if it's outside, all the better. If it's barefoot, all the better. But if it's just sitting on the floor in the quiet, all the better. If it's taking a bath in the morning, it's just, what do I need? Right. If I can start there, I can help you. And when I help you, I feel like a better mom. God. Oh. And now my daughter wakes up. She's like, Mom, I really need a morning bath. 
And what that shows me is that who and how we are, these are the greatest teachings. I can sit down and lay out the history of politics until my head falls off and then my kid turns up and he's rude to his sister and it's all gone. But if my kid can get up in the morning and say, wow, I'm a little out of sorts. Can we put extra salt in the bath? Of course you can, right? Or somebody says, can I just read in bed for an hour? Yes, you can. Because that way, the only way I could figure this out was to say, okay, every Friday, they were probably five years old and three years old, big books in bed. Big books are like an atlas or a picture book of the human body or these huge, beautiful books. And it takes so much time on each page. So we would get in bed, all of us, big books in bed, everybody in my bed, the biggest right. books you can find, just time. Mm -hmm. And that began to heal us. And we learned and we were together yeah. and it was whole. And it was very simple. But I think the pulse, mm -hmm. what we need is time together and then we need time apart. It's like breathing. We come together, we learn, we do, we work at the table, we clean up the house, and then we go to walk. We run, we make noise, we come back in, sit down, read your book, get up, move around, tend the house, go back outside. It's a pulse. And in that pulse, you have both a structure and a freedom. So when your kid's been sitting there doing online Zoom lessons, go to walk, go to walk, and then say, how's it going? Right. right. So that you can help be a part of this. Right. How are you doing? This must be crazy for you because this is crazy for me. How can I help you? But to do that while they're sitting in the same space where they had the Zoom, it's just they're at capacity. So get moving and digest it. Get it into your mm. body. And then mm. it's going to get so much easier. All right. Let's, first of all, I've learned a lot. I'm sort of Lamenting the fact that I'm not homeschooling <laughs> right now, but let's move on to some really salient takeaways for my listener. First of all, um, I'm pulling this out. I want you guys to just step in, interrupt me whenever you feel you must. One is to prioritize what's important for your family. For me now, finally, I'm in a place where hiking every day is super important, connecting with the earth, playing in my garden, making sure everybody's happy that being everybody, being my plants, my herbs, uh, making sure Jonah plays basketball every day, like some, some outdoor activity every day. So that's a priority. Set the priority for your family. Maybe there are a few priorities. Maybe there is something having to do with eating at least one meal together. We have dinner together every night now, which is super nice, which didn't happen previously. Um, okay, so that's first. Second is determine who's in charge of each meal. I think that feels really important to me. These are the notes that I've written down. I love that Dave is the short order cook for breakfast while you sit and toss in your sheets. <laughs> Johanna, that's the best. It works. <laughs> um, word. And I love the fact of giving everybody the space to like do what they need to do first mm -hmm. thing in the morning. Maybe one day you don't actually want to dive into a history lesson, but you do want to spend an hour in your bed with your book. Mm -hmm. Great. So that's allowed. What else can you guys think in terms of just having these sort of gently delineated facts about the running of the day? Anything? One thing that we might not have mentioned that we kind of started with is we're in this really unique position as parents and as homeschooling parents, and that we get to work with the development of the unique child in front of us, right? So I have very different children. They are all so different. And to be able to know where they are developmentally, right? I have one who is 12 going to be preteen. One's going through the nine-year change. I have one going through the seven-year change. One is about to be four. We're kind of in it right now. But I get to see that that's a normal part of human development and it's not oh, this child is, <laughs> is the problem, right? Got it. So, so learning about what each age uh, means and what the mm. transition from that age to the next age is a critical point too. So my listener, make sure you make a note about that too. There's lots of good information, particularly in, I mean, you can Google it online, but any Waldorf 
school worth their salt will hand out to the parents of each certain age. This is what's happening in your kid right now. So just be awake to this. So that's good. That's really good. Um, Martha, what were you going to say? I know that I am trying to run a business. I know that there are days right. when that is in direct conflict with what my kids need. And I'm learning to not take that personally, that who I am as their mother remains unchanged. We might be having a, schedule, a scheduling conflict. Um, I might be overwhelmed with what I've signed up for and what's trying to happen. But I'm a good mom and I'm a good worker and those aren't in question. Right. And that can be really difficult to keep hold of right now. And so it's, it's just getting a little perspective that this isn't questioning who you are. It's just creating a new structure. And I want to speak to, we're a little bit on the fringe. We're, we're a little looser. Johanna and I and the yoga world are looking at this. I want to address just for a second, my kid is going to school because they're going to learn enough to have a job. And I need that to happen right. because I need them to earn their money and live their life. And I, I so respect that. And so there may be less opportunity to lie in bed. There may be less opportunity for some of this sort of um, freer lifestyle. If you are of the mind where you just want your kid to go to school so you can just do your job, this can feel overwhelming. And I just want that to be respected. So the schools are doing what they can, and they're going to be offering information in the form that they can. And then you're going to be doing work when your child is working and they're online. Know exactly what you can accomplish in 20 minutes or 40 minutes. What's your top priority? Is it a meeting? Is it your email? What helps you feel like, okay, I got that box checked. So usually the night before I set out, these are the three things that I really, these are the deal breakers. So whenever my kids are settled, even in a 10 minute span, I check those boxes. I can be with them differently. And, and then when they're off Zoom and you're off your email, just walk around the block. Just walk around the block. And it can be that simple. Mm. And you're going to begin to notice that you know them a little bit differently. The takeaway here is for the parent, if you're listening, define, even the night before, the morning of, define what your top three to five priorities are for the day for yourself, for your own business, your own work. And work, so, so this way you know exactly what you're going to work towards when the kids are engaged and not needing you. And that gives you a little more space, time, heart freedom, mind freedom to be with them in a different way, be more present for them. And I really love what Martha was saying there that, you know, really, let's not make it more difficult than it needs to be. Um, parenting, homeschooling, it's really about focus, right? And it doesn't have to be all the time, but when we do get those moments, if we can see them. And I think knowing our children and our partner's love language and really how they need to be seen or how they really want to be honored is really important, right? My husband loves, his love language is like a clean house. <laughs> so he might not be feeling very loved recently. Um, however, right. um, I know now we did the love languages with each of the kids. And one of my little boys, all he wants are really positive affirmations. So even when I'm able to give him a, wow, you did it, that is really all he wants to hear. I could spend an hour kind of dawdling around not saying that, and he would not get what I needed, right? So being more precise mm. with how we utilize our time with our people, but also with ourselves. I used to think that I had to have a lot of time in work. And what I realized is I can do most of my work in a short amount of time during the day. What I need a lot of time for is just daydreaming and 
being creative. And I can do that with my kids. So figuring out that overlap too. Mm -hmm. That's very, very helpful. I love the idea of introducing the concept of love languages in our families as a matter of course, and finding out what each kid's love language is. That's a great, great point. I think that's a good way. Yeah, a good way to close. Um, I want to thank both of you for taking the time out on a Sunday to play and to teach me and teach my listener what, you know, what this is all about for you. I also want to say to my listener that, you know, if this is on your mind and something you've been thinking about, it's good. Reach out to folks who are doing it. And talk about it. Figure out if it's right for you. Because it very well might not be. Um, for me, it's just not right. My son loves school. He's one of those kids that actually really, I mean, maybe that's exaggerated. I don't <laughs> think he loves school. I think he loves, he loves being on his own and getting it done on his own. And he's, I don't have to go look over his shoulder. He does all of his homework. His teachers are really happy with him and todo bien, even on Zoom. But I will say this, if it is remotely possibly for you, it's worth it to have a conversation with someone else and really explore because if there's some little inkling, intuitive inkling inside of you that's saying, hey, maybe school isn't for my kid and maybe this way would be better, explore it because it's one life. It's one one go round with this crew. You know, they'll, you probably are going around with them in other lives, in other ways, in other forms, but this round, follow your heart if you're listening to this, because it might very well lead to, as Martha and Johanna have experienced, really a healed family yeah. in many ways. Guys, I want to thank you. And then we turn, we turn around and work with other families. You know, we shepherd families every year and help them get started and check in. And so if mm -hmm. anyone was interested it's easy to reach out. It's easy to connect. And I know that I'm absolutely available to say these are the resources. And where do you feel you want to fall? I'm happy to mm. just help you brainstorm about bringing a little bit more into a very structured setting or cutting the ties and starting something of your own. It's very, very personal. Mm. And having a guide is a, a reassurance. So happy to help. Absolutely happy to help. I highly recommend having a mentor like Martha. I have worked with Carrie from the Parenting Passageway, who is a brilliant help and source. And um, just having someone who is not tied into our story a little bit, right? Who can see us from the outside and say, mm, that might be a little too much. Yes. <laughs> um, is really helpful. And Remembering that the revolutionary change that you could be looking for, it all is right there inside of you. It's not out somewhere else. It's all within inside of you. I think to really close this up, I want my listener to know that I'm going to make sure that all of these resources are available in the show notes here so that you can click and reach Johanna, click and reach Martha, click and reach Carrie, whomever um, sounds resonant to you. And I think it's worth it to continue this dialogue. So if I may, ladies, would you be open to coming back on a second time in a few months just to check in and see how things are going? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay, cool. Conversations and nourishment are my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> Those are your love languages, sister. That I know. I know that about you. My gosh. All right. Well, thank you both so much. I really love and respect both of you a great deal. I'm so happy that you're in my life and I feel very lucky to work with you so closely. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.